Good afternoon. I'm John Shorciari, the director of the Weiser Diplomacy Center here at the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy at the University of Michigan. On behalf of Dean Michael Barr, who's with us here today in the audience, it's a great pleasure to welcome all of you to this Policy Talks at the Ford School with David Miliband. This event is part of the Josh Rosenthal Education Fund Lecture Series, established in memory of Josh Rosenthal, a 1979 UM graduate who passed away in the 9-11 attacks on the World Trade Center. The lecture series established in his name aims to promote better understanding of different societies around the world, international relations, human rights, and peaceful conflict resolution. Our talk today is also part of our lecture series at the Weiser Diplomacy Center, established in 2018 through the generosity of Regent and Ambassador Ron Weiser and Eileen Weiser. The center focuses on practical student training in foreign affairs and engagement with the diplomatic community to help address pressing global challenges. This event is also a highlight of our UM theme semester on democracy and debate, and we're holding it today in view of the scheduled presidential debate and now the parallel town hall events to help shed light on the international implications of the upcoming election. I'd like to thank the University Musical Society and its president, Matthew Van Beeson, for making this event possible by connecting us to one of the leads, one of the world's leading analysts and practitioners of international affairs, David Miliband. Before we dive into the discussion, let me very briefly introduce him. He's the president and CEO of the International Rescue Committee, overseeing IRC's relief and development operations in dozens of countries, its refugee resettlement and assistance programs, and its advocacy efforts on behalf of many of the world's most vulnerable populations. Before joining IRC, he had a distinguished political career, serving from 2007 to 2010 as the youngest British Foreign Secretary in three decades. He also served as Environment Secretary and in Parliament, and there's much more I could add, but I hope it will suffice to quote former President Bill Clinton, who has described him as, quote, one of the ablest, most creative public servants of our time. We'll start today with a virtual armchair conversation. I'll pose some high-level questions to get key themes on the table, and then we'll open to audience Q&A. We've received some, in, some questions from you in advance, but you can also submit questions via the live chat on YouTube or tweet your questions to hashtag policy talks. So welcome, Secretary Miliband, and thank you for joining us today. Well, Professor, thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you to the Visor Center. I really am honored to be with you. I'm just extremely disappointed that I can't actually be with you and that we're only able to have a virtual conversation. My friend, Matthew Van Beesian, since he arrived in Michigan a couple of years ago, has never ceased to talk of its wonders. And I did promise that I would find a way to come. I've not yet managed to uh, fulfill that promise. Um, on a more serious note, just let me take 30 seconds to recognize the significance of uh, Josh Rosenthal's life and uh, his contribution to the university, his enduring contribution to the university. There's something I, I think deeply appropriate that just this morning, I was participating in a meeting of the Afghanistan study group, which has been uh, mandated by Congress through the US Institute of Peace to think about uh, future U.S. policy towards uh, Afghanistan, and it seems I'm a member of that Afghan study group. It seems particularly appropriate that we're having uh, this conversation today. Thank you, and uh, and we will indeed take you up on your uh, on your interest in visiting us in person. And delighted to be able to speak virtually today. Let's jump right into it um, by asking you the first of a series of high-level questions about international affairs and the implications of the election in recent years. We've all heard many analysts uh, lament the decline of the liberal international order. To what extent do you share that assessment and what do you see as the principal forces undermining the norms and institutions that define that order? So I think that's one of the uh, most important questions facing the world today. I I'd answer it uh, in three parts. Uh, the first relates to my work as the president of the International Rescue Committee, working in war zones and refugee hosting states uh, around the world. The second is what we mean by the liberal international order, so-called, and then uh, what uh, might be causing its demise or its uh, retreat. Uh, very briefly, uh, our work is marked increasingly by the violation of international laws and norms. There are international laws against the bombing of civilians, but we know that in Syria uh, that's happened, in uh, Yemen that has happened. Uh, we know that there are 
laws against the targeting of aid workers, but two International Rescue Committee aid workers were targeted at driving an ambulance in northwest Syria uh, last year. We know that international law gives rights to those fleeing and seeking asylum, yet we're seeing increasing numbers of countries not abiding by uh, those international commitments. I, I call this the age of impunity, and that uh, frames uh, the second part of my answer. What was the liberal international order? It wasn't liberal in the sense of being left-wing. Liberal in the sense in which it's described is that it gave rights to individuals, human rights, as well as rights to states. Uh, between 1648, the Treaty of Westphalia, and really 1945, there were only so the rights of sovereign states in the international system. The uh, liberal rules-based international order tried to give rights to individuals as well as rights to states. So that was the sense in which it was liberal. It was international in the sense that it bound every country on the planet, communist and capitalist, dictatorships and democracies, that they were all meant to be part of it. And it was an order in the sense that there were institutions dedicated to upholding uh, the, the order and the compromises necessary uh, to make it possible. Uh, I hope you're not hearing too much of the dog who's barking uh, in the next door apartment here in New York. I, I, it's not actually our dog, but it's a very loud, very small, and very loud dog next door. I hope it's not interfering too much in uh, in the broadcast. I apologize uh, on, on the dog's behalf. Um, and then the third uh, element, which I think you're, where your question is, is really um, deep and important, it, it is why should there be an increasing impunity around the world? Why should the world be marked by increasing... Um, defiance of the laws and norms of war um, that were so hard fought and that learned the lessons of the interwar uh, period. I think there's a number of uh, reasons for that. First of all, there's the rise of non-state actors who don't consider them, themselves bound uh, by uh, laws and norms signed by states. But secondly, there's the shift in the balance of economic and political power to those states who don't want to abide by individual rights uh, that are given to uh, uh, people. And thirdly, there's also the fact that in our own democratic countries, the countries of liberal democracy, uh, there's been a retreat uh, from the defense of some of those laws and norms. And together, those factors create a situation where the fragmentation of commitment uh, to the rule, what I prefer to call the rules-based international order, leaves us in quite a perilous position given the interdependence uh, of the uh, world. And so there's not, much, there's, there's, there's not much liberal, there's not much international, there's not much, not much ordered about the way the world is being governed at the moment. Great. And a follow-up to that is to, to look more specifically at two of the, the key challenges of our time, the global refugee crisis and the pandemic. In what ways do you see the international responses, or in some cases the lack thereof, as, as uh, being emblematic of the broader trends that you've described? Well, maybe I could start with the second, the pandemic, because that has obviously changed all of our lives. It's a pandemic of the connected world. Uh, as someone pointed out to me, uh, many people have assumed in, when they created the international health regulations in 2005, that disease would spread from poor countries to rich countries. That's why uh, there uh, is an insistence that uh, travel bans are not really part of the armory. Uh, because it's assumed that poor, the poorest countries don't uh, have people who are traveling. Now, this disease is a disease of the connected world, which obviously started in China, but that was then spread uh, from the ski slopes of Italy. It was uh, a rich person's disease rather than a poor person's disease. It's grown in the richer countries in, in, the, main, or in, in the first instance, although it's been the poorest people in those countries who generally suffered uh, the most. So you have this situation of a disease of the connected uh, world where the response has been decidedly disconnected. Uh, what I see is a fragmented international system in which the advice of the World Health Organization is contested, uh, in which the social and economic response is very national rather than international, uh, and in which there is, for the poorer countries of the world, a situation close to sink or swim. And uh, so in that sense, we, we have the, uh, a response that defies the central lesson of the disease, at least as I see it, which is that the world is ever more interdependent, yet the reactions or the response has been uh, increasingly from independent nation states. We see that within Europe, where different countries are doing their own thing. Uh, the European Union actually hasn't had much of a public health responsibility. And obviously, we see it at the 
a global uh, level uh, as well. So I think that um, this is obviously a moment when there's a need for action, um, but it's also a, a teachable uh, moment. And I think that it speaks to uh, some lessons about the uh, power uh, and the financing of international health efforts. Three billion people are living without running water in their own homes today. That's, that's a weak link in the global chain. Uh, but so, so are issues relating to the powers of the World Health Organization uh, and its uh, financing. I think that in respect of the refugee question which you uh, raised, uh, there's a lot of politics as well as policy in that. And I had the good fortune with you, Professor, to uh, meet 30 or 40 of the University of Michigan students at, at lunchtime today to discuss uh, the issues around refugees, displaced people. Uh, I pointed out that we went into this crisis with more people displaced by conflict and persecution than any time since the Second World War. 79 and a half million, more than 1% of the world's population for the first time uh, since records began. Uh, and without wishing to spend the whole of the rest of this, this talk on this refugee issue, I think it speaks um, to the first question you raised about uh, the relative balance of power between global uh, action and national uh, action. Because refugees are, if you like, a, a classic case where the hosting of refugees is a global public good. Uh, the, the countries that host refugees are uh, doing everyone a favor, uh, not just the refugees uh, themselves. And those countries are in the main poor countries. 85% of the world's refugees are in poor countries, not in rich countries. Um, Europe, North America, um, we, we have uh, very few uh, refugees by comparison with countries like Bangladesh, which uh, has a, over a million uh, refugees from Myanmar, a Uganda, over a million refugees uh, from uh, South Sudan, never mind Turkey with three and a half million uh, refugees from Syria or Pakistan uh, with uh, a similar number or even more uh, from Afghanistan. Uh, that global public good is not being supported in an effective way. And so people like me argue that at a time of greater interdependence, uh, we need to learn uh, lessons of mutual responsibility. I appreciate that's not necessarily um, an immediately popular um, political position in some quarters. But what I try to point out to people is a couple of things. First, that of course the first responsibility of government is to its own people. Uh, but if the vision of government ends at the nation's borders, then it doesn't do justice to the interdependent world in which we live. And secondly, uh, I spent time in government, it's very hard to sustain the argument that effective global health response takes away from effective national or local response. They're operated by different parts of the international political system. And so I think it's a bit of a false choice to argue that it's the national level that needs to take press to uh, squeeze out the international level. We've got to be able to walk into chew gum at the same time. With all of the challenges uh, that we've been discussing, 2020 is often described as a dark and difficult year, but you work every day with thousands of people who are out on the front lines, courageously meeting these challenges, who have hope and optimism about, uh, about uh, paths forward. Share with us a few of your insights on where you see the greatest positive news coming out of these crises, where you see nuggets of cooperation and, and, and ways that those could expand. Yeah, that's a really interesting uh, way of thinking about it. My, my perspective is uh, captured in a little slogan, which I hope isn't glib, but which was uh, given to me by a film crew that were in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And they said, if you look at the statistics, you can get depressed. And if you look at the people, you've got hope. <laughs> uh, that's really the way I look at this. When I, when I see the people that the International Rescue Committee is serving, we were founded by Albert Einstein in the 1930s to rescue Jews and intellectuals being persecuted by the Nazis in Europe. Uh, we now work in 40 countries around the world with 13,000 employees and 17,000 uh, day volunteers drawn from the displaced communities, helping war-torn communities, displaced communities, refugee communities uh, survive, recover, and gain control of their lives. Um, what, what I see is people with extraordinary resilience, uh, extraordinary determination, and uh, just abiding human determination uh, to make sure that their children, if not them, get the opportunities that they deserve. And uh, while those people are tenacious and courageous and determined and even optimistic sometimes, not always, because we shouldn't sugarcoat this, I, I feel that it's incumbent on us to, to repay their tenacity uh, with commitment of our own. And maybe just to give you one story that I always carry uh, with me, 
um, because it exemplifies both the responsibilities of uh, a refugee hosting state and the contribution that refugees uh, can make. The refugees are often seen as a burden, and I think it's better to see them as people, as uh, assets. Um, I was in Uganda, in Kampala, the uh, capital of Uganda, as I said earlier, one and a half million refugees from South uh, Sudan in that country. And I was introduced to a woman who was working uh, in an IRC, International Rescue Committee, Economic Livelihoods Program. We, we supply health, education, and livelihood support. And she was uh, running a banana ripening uh, business, a one-person business. She, she bought bananas and she then ripened them in a, a little hut that we um, helped pay for the rent for. And then she uh, went on to sell the ripened bananas um, six weeks later at a handy little uh, profit. And I said to her, um, what did she do with the money that she made? And she said, well, obviously I support myself, but I also um, help pay for the school books and the pencils um, and the clothes for my daughter. She said, I want to meet my daughter. I said, yeah, I definitely want to meet her. But she says, you'll be impressed. She, I paid for her to go through high school. She then went to the University of Kampala, and now she's doing a master's degree in public health. I said, I oh, definitely want to speak to her. And I was introduced to this young woman. And I said to her, well, what, what do you want to do? when you've got your master's degree in public health. She said, I want to go back to South Sudan to mend my own country. And it's stories like that that speak to tenacity, courage, resilience, and even optimism in the face of unspeakable trauma. This family had had um, I mean, terrible killing of their own uh, relatives, but there that the human spirit was shining through. And I think that's the kind of thing that really puts into perspective some of the uh, cultural complaint that we, we fall into ourselves. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, that powerful example. Uh, and I wanted to, to pivot a little bit to speak about uh, a role, the, the roles that you have uh, held uh, in the British government uh, and your long history of being at the center of Anglo-American relations. In navigating the, the path ahead, what do you see as the role for the, the special relationship? How can the U.S. and, and U.K. governments uh, play a distinctive role together in addressing some of the many challenges that we've been discussing? Mm. I mean, that's quite a, a deep and vexed question, obviously. You're in the middle of an extraordinarily um, tense election period yourself, and the UK is suffering its own trauma of uh, Brexit. Uh, I was very lucky as Secretary of State. I uh, was Secretary of State from 2007, 2010, as you said, and obviously my American opposite numbers were two extraordinarily talented women. First of all, Condoleezza Rice and then Hillary Clinton, uh, more or less 18 months each, were my opposite uh, numbers. And with both of them coming from uh, different political perspectives, obviously, uh, there was enormously close diplomatic effort together on the crises of our time. When, when Benazir Bhutto was assassinated, the first person I spoke to was Condoleezza Rice about what is the what are the implications? What can we do? Um, Benazir Bhutto had obviously been in the UK before she went back to uh, Pakistan uh, uh, and was tragically assassinated. Um, later, uh, during uh, Hillary Clinton's uh, time uh, in office in the vagaries of the war in uh, Sri Lanka, or, uh, there was a, a real uh, tightness that wasn't just bilateral because both of us saw that we were members of the UN Security Council together, uh, the UK uh, was a proud member of the European Union at the time. And so one uh, felt that despite the very clear delineation between the superpower that the US was, um, the UK is not a superpower in, uh, in its uh, economic size or in its uh, political or in its uh, military uh, clout, um, but we were playing a, an important role uh, together. And we were bound by a set of shared values, not just by uh, uh, history. Um, I think that's now uh, on the table in a, in a in really quite a profound way. Obviously, you've got a debate going on, and we'll see if there is a proper uh, accord to this in the course of the presidential campaign. It's obviously not a central issue, but the future of NATO, there's obviously big differences between the uh, two presidential candidates on that uh, question. The future of American engagement in Europe, uh, with Europe, it, it is on the table, but so is British 
engagement with Europe. I, just without wishing to, I know this is not a political event of any kind, but I'm, I was on the very strongly anti-Brexit side. I don't want to hide that uh, from anyone. I think it was a, an act of unilateral political disarmament by the uh, UK uh, to leave a European Union that was such a force multiplier uh, for us. And so what I would say is that the uh, Anglo-American relationship, sometimes called the special relation, it, it needs to be uh, refounded uh, for the modern age in a world where Britain has dealt itself out of the European Union and America obviously has a lot of um, questions it wants to address about its own internal functioning. My own view is that neither country can take a holiday from history and say that they're going to spend the next 10 years just focusing on domestic policy and come back to global issues. As we've seen with COVID, uh, global issues have a way of crashing in through your uh, living room um, window. And so I think it's going to be a real test of political leadership, but also of the views of citizens and civil society uh, about how we tackle domestic problems in a way that um, sets an example, uh, but also uh, leaves space for international engagement in a world whose power that balance is changing all the time. Great. I, I'm going to ask one more very broad question of you, and then those of you who are watching, please uh, submit your questions. We're going to turn to your question next. The last one for me uh, is to ask about what you see as some of the, uh, the key ways in which the upcoming U.S. presidential election uh, will resonate globally, and more specifically, if you were one of our viewers, who's gonna tune in later tonight to the dueling uh, campaign events, the uh, dueling uh, town hall events, or next week's scheduled debate, what specifically would you be looking for from the candidates uh, uh, to, to hear in, in forming a judgment on their foreign policies? Just say again the first part of the question. I lost you a bit for the first part of the question. Sure, the first part was, what do you see as some of the key ramifications nice. of the upcoming US presidential debate? And with that in mind, what would you be looking for in the upcoming town halls and the final debate? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I don't want to burden you all as those of you who are American citizens, but you do have outsized influence on uh, the rest of the world. Um, American politicians often describe themselves as the, describe the country as the leader of the free world, and they do so for good reason. I mean, you are the most powerful democracy in the world. And so your example, never mind your uh, words and your decisions, have real impact. We know, that just to take a slightly parochial example, when the U.S. reduces by 85 percent the number of refugees being allowed into America under the Refugee Resettlement Program, which the, is a decision of the Trump administration, that has implications abroad. I mean, other countries follow. Uh, and uh, that there are much wider uh, questions when you decide, as the Trump administration has to withdraw from the World Health Organization, that has big ramifications. So your decisions have uh, outsized influence. Uh, and obviously the um, roiling debate that's going on in the US about its role in the world um, is one which is an international leader, not just an international uh, laggard. We've seen that the, uh, some of the uh, policies of the Trump administration have been followed elsewhere. Uh, we've seen a, I mean, I'd almost call it a crisis of confidence amongst the uh, liberal democratic countries of the world about the nature of the partnership that they have with each other. and. Uh, the dangers of a transactional approach to international affairs. Uh, and obviously a concern that at a time when China is clearly rising, the, the Chinese adage of hide your strength and bide your time has clearly been replaced by the current Chinese leadership. It's left many countries asking, well, where's the alliance that engages with that uh, rise, either to um, cooperate in areas like climate change or global health, uh, or to compete uh, on the economic front, certainly in Europe, that's a big uh, question. So, uh, as I say, I don't want to overburden you with outsized uh, responsibilities, uh, but um, the rules-based order that was built after the Second World War that uh, sustained the longest period of peace and prosperity, really, that any, um, any of our continents have known, um, it, it is under un, uh, uh, un, unseasonable stress, uh, as you asked in your first question. And the U.S. decision about whether... Uh, to help reinvent that order or whether to abandon it is, is absolutely key. I mean, in terms of, um, and by the way, uh, people are watching the, you, you may not think this is a good thing, but they, uh, a lot of people around the world watch the first debate and uh, there are cues, uh, cues in the sense of C-U-E-S, not, 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 not lines. There are cues taken um, 
from that um, about the health of democratic systems, about the efficacy of democratic systems, about the vi even the viability of uh, democratic systems around the world. And so I, I think what, uh, rather than give a long answer about the, um, it's not really a debate today, is it? It's a, um, a set of question and answer sessions. Um, uh, maybe even at, at uh, the same time. Um, I think that people are looking uh, for mature leadership at this time. I think certainly for the next debate in a week's time, uh, people will be tuning in and seeing whether there's further dissent or whether uh, the, the ship rights itself and serious political argument uh, takes place in a way that does justice to the issues at hand. And that's certainly what I think is important over the next 20 days and obviously given the debate you're having about um, the, 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 the viability of the result what happens between November the 3rd and January the 20th as well thank you uh, very helpful insights and now I want to turn to our audience questions uh, the first one is about IRC's work with regard to refugee populations and the question is in light of uh, the ideologies of, of, of populist nationalism uh, that are militating against uh, a welcoming environment for refugees. How is IRC responding to that? Are you trying to, uh, in a sense, reverse that trend uh, globally as, as the questioner sees it? Well, there are three things that I would say to that. First of all, it's important to recognize the countries that aren't putting up barriers to refugees coming in. I mentioned a million and a half refugees in Bangladesh, a million and a half in uh, um, Uganda. Uh, uh, the, the phenomenon of blocking um, asylum seeking or uh, refugee hosting is one where I'm afraid um, the US, but also to some extent uh, countries in Europe, um, are, are not giving a uh, good example. And we, uh, secondly, make the case uh, that it's not just a matter of having a big heart to recognize that um, refugees should be given haven. It's not just a matter of uh, re recognizing history to say that refugees and asylum seekers should be given a haven. It's not even just a matter of law to say that if someone claims asylum, they should have their case properly uh, addressed. Uh, we also say that uh, refugees are productive contributors to the countries that they come to. We know from the US, uh, the International Rescue Committee is now the largest refugee resettlement agency in the US. We know from 40 years that these people pay more in taxes than they claim in welfare benefits um, in the course of their uh, commitment. They become patriotic and productive uh, citizens. And so we think there's an argument to be made. And it's interesting that in Germany, there was, um, which took uh, one and a half million uh, asylum claims in 2015, 16, um, not all of them succeeded. And of course, that, that, that's reasonable uh, because um, the, the system is designed to recognize those who have a well-founded fear of persecution and it's not safe to go home. But the debate in Germany has changed through the efficacy of their efforts to integrate refugees into German society. And from our point of view as a non-governmental organization, it's not a political organization, we advocate on the basis of what we know and what we do and what we see. And that's certainly, I think, the most powerful way to, to contribute to a more sane politics on these issues. Thanks. And of course, in addition to policy advocacy, IRC is very involved in direct service provision to, to refugee communities. And our second question is more along those lines. The questioner asks, what can we as individuals do uh, to effectuate change for refugees in our communities? Thanks. That's a great uh, question. And there are three or four important uh, parts of that. Um, we operate in 25 cities around the US, sadly not in Michigan. The um, uh, refugee resettlement network is split up between different organizations, Catholic Charities, uh, Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, etc. Um, but the first thing I always say is that uh, many of your students, that they may, they may be, uh, have homes, um, they may come from cities where we do work, some large, uh, Los Angeles, some small, Boise, Idaho, Wichita, Kansas. So um, there, we, we, we love to say that refugees need buddies, they need mentors, they need uh, volunteers to, to support them. Uh, secondly, if you're an employer, uh, I can't say to you, please give a refugee a job, but I can say, please give them a chance of a job. Please give them a chance to apply for a job. Please seek, seek out people who've had to flee for their lives, uh, who've learned about trust and cooperation, and who have enormous incentive to make a go of their new uh, life in the country. Uh, thirdly, uh, I would say, please acquaint yourselves with the issues uh, and the people 
who, who, who constitute a refugee population. If you go to rescue.org, which is our website, you can see stories about uh, refugee communities around the US or refugees who contributed to their communities around the US, but also uh, from the uh, beginning of the arc of crisis from Syria or Somalia or Afghanistan, what conditions they've left behind and what work we're doing there. And I, I think that uh, informing yourselves as citizens is, is incredibly important. And there's a fourth thing, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say this, but um, I'm British, so um, you know we hate talking about money, but um, if uh, you'll allow me, if those of your, the viewers who are able to make financial contributions to charity, um, we would uh, love you to contribute to our work. About a quarter of our budget, about a quarter of the $800 million comes from individuals, foundations, and corporations. I've lived in New York, so I'm less uh, bashful about talking about that. But, but the, uh, um, the, the work we do, the risk capital that we have comes from the private sector. We're proud of our government support. There's $600 million from governments around the world. Um, but we know that our private supporters allow us to take the risks, to go to the places that aren't in the headlines. And we'd love that kind of engagement as well. Great. Uh, shifting to another topic, looking at, at uh, politics in the UK and Europe, uh, the next question is about Brexit and whether you think or to what extent you see a risk that Brexit would lead to a breakup of the UK uh, via Scottish in independence or an Irish unification. Well, Brexit is a very traumatic topic for me, so you're going to have to cut me off before I sort of talk for three hours about it. Um, because um, I, I'm very proud to be British. I, I see the uh, unity of the United Kingdom as an important part of it. Uh, and I see um, Britain as part of Europe, um, not as separate from uh, Europe. And now uh, we do face um, really a set of existential questions uh, about uh, Britain, not just about Europe. I think when uh, Britain uh, left the European Union or in the campaign that was waged to persuade Brit Brits to support leaving, though, many of those who were arguing for leave thought it would uh, presage a breakup of the European Union. In fact, uh, Europe has looked at the Brexit process and become more united rather than less. Uh, on the other side of the coin, um, the strains in the UK are real. Um, Northern Ireland and, and uh, Scotland both voted very strongly uh, to remain. And so there is now a serious debate uh, in Scotland uh, about uh, revisiting the independence referendum that happened in 2014. Um, independence was defeated reasonably soundly, 55-45 in that uh, referendum. But there is a new debate going on in Scotland uh, about whether or not they want to remain in the United Kingdom. And uh, anyone who looks at this must recognize that there's now a very serious risk to the world's most successful union of uh, countries that have been united since uh, 1707, since uh, uh, really uh, the foundation of the UK. And I think that um, the direct answer to your question is that the risks are now real, despite the fact that the problems that exist over the question of a border in Northern Ireland, I mean, the border in Northern Ireland between Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland is smaller, is, is smaller in uh, geographic uh, length than the, obviously the border between Scotland and England. If you think there are problems in policing a border between Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland, there's um, you know, many really difficult issues associated with that. So I'm afraid the, um, the drag for UK politics is going to be very internal, uh, even without the uh, Brexit crisis, where I'm afraid our um, economic performance and our health performance are both suffering in the same way that the, the, the US is. And of course, the, uh, the UK is not the only country that in various ways has been pulling back from Europe. And our next question is about US-European relations and whether the US withdrawal or in some forms disengagement from Europe uh, is having an unintended but po possibly positive side effect of generating greater European unity. Well, that's, that's an interesting way of thinking about it. I mean, the, um, I'd say two things. First of all, um, the European Union does face big questions that divide not just north from south. Uh, creditors and debtors is something that um, an American audience maybe has uh, read about uh, during the Euro crisis. There's also an east-west uh, division, uh, Hungary um, notably. Um, trying to uh, redefine the value base of the European Union. So I don't want to paint a Panglossian picture of European uh, unity. Secondly, I think there's no question that um, the focus of successive American presidents, I don't want to make this just about uh, President Trump, um, 
uh, successive American presidents have spoken the need to do quote unquote nation building at home. I think that, that phrase came from uh, President Obama. Um, now, obviously, that uh, process of uh, fo home focus has been turbocharged in the last uh, four years. Uh, President Trump has uh, made no secret of his disdain for some of the multilateral alliances that uh, the, U that, uh, the U.S. has with European colleagues. And there's no question that also, in my mind, that there's now some hedging that Europeans are having to do uh, about how to think about the American partnership in the future. They, they have to have in mind that over a 10 or 20 year period, uh, there's a danger that America will not be the kind of reliable ally. And that's promoting, at, the, at this stage, um, I think, quite deep uh, soul-searching in different European countries. They have a different relationship with the U.S., obviously, but deep soul-searching and also some quite big questions. I mean, just to give you one example, uh, Europe and uh, China have now made major commitments on uh, decarbonization and uh, on net zero, as it's called. Um, now, that is a... Uh, going to be a major regulatory force uh, in the future. I mean, the world's largest, richest single market in, uh, in Europe, uh, world's more or less largest, biggest economy in China. Um, you're going to see uh, regulatory drives uh, in that domain. And many Europeans are asking themselves, um, can we count on America to be with us in that drive, which is going to reshape our economy and in some ways our society in the next 20 or 30 years, and may also reshape international uh, relations. Um, that's something which is, uh, can only be answered in, in, in time. I mean, obviously, your election decision is significant in that respect, but I think this is longer term than one presidential uh, cycle. Yeah, the next question is very closely related, and, and the question is how you would characterize what you see as the appropriate uh, U.S. role on the world stage, given your experience as foreign secretary, and whether the conduct of the current U.S. administration has hampered the ability of the United States to play that role going forward. I, mean, I would like to see the U.S. as one of the key anchors, if not the key anchor, of the global rules-based system. I'd like to see it as a bulwark against impunity, the abuse of power by the uh, powerful. Uh, and I'd like to see it as a force, not just for its interests, but for its values. Uh, a force that gains strength through, as people say, the power of its example, through the alliances that it, uh, that it has. And um, that, I think, is a very, um, uh, is, is a definition of its role that isn't selfless. I'm not recommending that in the belief that America should simply be a piggy bank uh, for the world, a, 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 an ATM machine for the world. I think it's significantly in America's interest to be that anchor of a rules-based international order. America benefits enormously um, from that uh, order and will benefit in the future if it um, helps to sustain it. It shouldn't sustain it alone, it should sustain it in partnership, both with allies who choose to be part of that drive out of um, their value commitment, but also out of rivals who come to feel they've got no choice but to play by the uh, rules, that they've got incentives to play by the rules. Um, now, the uh, I don't make comments on political personalities, but I'm happy to talk about individual policies that the administration over the last four years has pursued. I won't cover all of them, uh, but in respect of the World Health Organization, which I mentioned, uh, in respect of the uh, Paris Climate Agreement, which is relevant to the what I see as a generational um, challenge of, of, of global warming, but also something which affects our work, because we know that climate change is a conflict uh, multiplier. Um, w w in those two examples, I'm afraid that the withdrawal of America from uh, global leadership has deleterious uh, consequences, has negative consequences, and some of them have yet to be uh, followed uh, through. So uh, from my point of view, there's a real question now about the fork in the road that's represented by the choice that you have at the election, but also if President Trump is re-elected, um, contrary to the current uh, polls, but we're all a bit more skeptical about polls than we were uh, 10 years ago. Um, uh, which fork does he take? Which which direction does, does he take? And that's why this is a moment of particular uncertainty and why I think it's particularly important that there's a, a, a mature debate uh, about the ramifications of the choices that you face. No, no one should ask you to make choices in someone else's interest. There are ramifications for you as well.
Great. And you were just speaking about leadership at the country level, but our next question is about leadership at a more individual level. Uh, you are leading now a prominent non-governmental organization. You've led a, a number of different major government organizations. What have you taken away for that as the key attributes of a good leader or aspects of good leadership? Um, that's, a, that's a, it's a good question. And there are too many um, business school books and political science books that tell you um, what the answer is. So I'll try not to, uh, not, not to rely on, on them. I, I, I think that the most important thing, that they'll, they'll tell you in uh, management school that uh, vision is the first quality of leadership. I think the first quality of leadership is passion. People will know from the first second that you work, walk into your office whether you're authentic about the mission. And if you don't believe in the mission, everyone will know it and nothing will get done. And so I think the authenticity and sincerity uh, with which you are committed to a mission, whether you see the uh, leadership role you're playing as a, as, a, as a job or as a vocation, I think is really important. Uh, the second thing, perhaps speaking to some more uh, contemporary issues, is that it's very, very important in leadership, I think, to minimize, uh, preferably to zero, the difference between what you say publicly and what you say privately, and certainly to minimize the difference between what you do publicly and what you do uh, privately. If there's dissonance between uh, what you say you do and what you actually do, then I'm afraid it's um, a real source of, of weakness and, and will get found out because in the, current, in the modern world, nothing's, nothing's private uh, really anymore. I think the third thing, I'll only give you three. Um, I'm a great believer that you've really uh, got to, find, to make time to, make, to put a premium uh, on thinking, not just thinking in isolation, but opening up the shutters of your, of your room uh, to challenge, to uh, new ways of thinking, to, to renewal. And I've seen leadership fail when it closes the shutters, and I've seen it renew itself effectively when it opens the shutters. And that commitment to thinking and articulating what you're learning seems to me incredibly uh, important in uh, trying to sustain leadership because there's a short-termism in everything these days, and one has to beware that um, to, to remain in a leadership role. I think you have to have an open mind that's clearly able to renew itself. And that's something I try and make time for myself. Okay, great. Our next question comes back to your leadership currently at IRC and asks how the lower level of refugees admitted into the United States in recent years has affected your operations. Yeah, I mean, just for the benefit of people, the, the, the long run historic average of refugees being um, in, uh, late, allowed into the US on the resettlement route has been about 90, 95,000. Um, this year, it's going to be only 12,000. Um, the Trump administration set a cap of 15,000. And that's put enormous strain on our teams around the country. We've had to close three offices. So we've now got 25 offices rather than uh, 28. Um, what we've done is, is a couple of things. First of all, we've um, doubled down on our support for refugees who've already arrived over the last five, seven years, to do everything possible to make successful their integration in American life. Uh, secondly, we've um, expanded our services for asylum seekers, so we're not simply a refugee resettlement uh, agency. We've uh, recognized that there are people who are claiming asylum and that they need our uh, support as well, consistent with our mission. Uh, thirdly, I'm afraid to say that the U.S. is um, quite vulnerable, quite um, strikingly uh, uh, hit by people trafficking, uh, which is another example of forced displacement. And so we've expanded our, our work in, in, in those areas. In everything that we do, we try and be part of local coalitions for civic renewal, whether in uh, Baltimore uh, or in New York or in Boise, Idaho and Wichita. We try to be part of the local community that shows the asset that people from outside can be. Thank you. Uh, of course, IRC also does a lot of work overseas, including Africa. And our next questioner asks about whether there are Pan-African solutions possible to dealing with displaced people, uh, given the myriad of uh, cases on the continent in which people have been displaced from their homes. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. I mean, Africa is a huge continent state, the obvious over 50 countries, a uh, billion people. Um, 
some of the most dynamic economies in the world, but also some of the most deep rooted uh, poverty and uh, crisis. Um, I'm not sure about a pan-African solution. I mean, there's certainly some big steps being taken to um, cross Africa trade issues, a vision of a free trade area for, for Africa. But I think at a sub-regional level, uh, there is room for much greater uh, cooperation, uh, including on issues to do with uh, refugees and uh, asylum seekers and, and migrants. Uh, we know that the greatest responsibility for dealing with a civil war is on the country that is consumed by war. Uh, but the neighboring states are not far behind. And um, the, the difficulties in the Lake Chad Basin in northeast Nigeria, Cameroon, Chad, Niger, um, the difficulties from one country are felt in the neighboring states. The difficulties across the Sahel are, are felt in a sub-region. Um, the role that Uganda, uh, Kenya, Ethiopia uh, play in hosting refugees from Somalia, from South Sudan, and from Eritrea. Um, those are the room where, uh, areas where I think there is room for sub-regional uh, support because most refugees don't go very far. As I said earlier, 86% of them are in uh, poor and lower middle income countries and that reflects the fact that generally they stay, refugees stay in the country next door, even though only 3% went home last year. Right. Uh, turning a little bit to public health, uh, our next question asks whether by necessity the pandemic has brought on any innovative uh, problem solving for refugee health and welfare around the world that might otherwise have gone unnoticed or unresolved. That's really interesting because we're very um, keen to develop uh, a, uh, a low tech version of telehealth that could actually be a benefit for uh, refugees and migrant uh, populations. Some of the, I think it's important I say, some of the basics, hand washing, face masks, I'm very proud that in uh, in Bangladesh, we've worked with a local women's organization to produce 500,000 masks. Um, so th those are universal. They're not particularly um, innovative, but they are uh, important. But in terms of innovation, um, I think that the, um, the two examples I would give, one is about using telehealth to try to uh, support community health workers in doing their job rather than expecting people to get to health centers, take the health care to people. And I'm afraid the non-COVID health impacts of uh, the crisis, uh, impacts on malaria, impacts on immunization and vaccination, um, the interruption of cold chains, those are uh, really um, quite uh, reaching quite dangerous uh, levels now. And we're, we're hoping to use uh, telehealth and teleoutreach to always con cognize that um, most of the people that we are supporting, that they haven't got a uh, iPhone 11 in their hands. They haven't got the connectivity that allows me to, to speak to you at a, a thousand miles dif distance in the way that uh, we can. But using mobile phones, using much more basic technology, uh, we're trying to make sure that we take health to people in innovative ways. The second area is the use of social media to combat disinformation. This is kind of wouldn't have normally been seen as a public health responsibility. But I promise you, in every place that we work, the so-called fake news, disinformation, is an important and dangerous block on the kind of um, basic public health messaging that we try to do. So I'm thinking of Pakistan, where we've really uh, used a lot of social media to try to uh, get appropriate messages across, always trying to use trusted local parties, local people uh, to take the message, because it's not, it's not right to, to try and jet that in from outside. You've got to try and generate local, credible, sources of information and maybe that's the second area that the crisis has spawned some important innovation. Great. Um, our next question is about the role of NGOs and the question asks about how you would characterize conceptually the role of NGOs uh, in addressing these challenges and how could they be most helpful in forging collaboration with governments? Yeah, my, my theory of social and economic and political change is, is very basic. It, 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 wouldn't, it wouldn't qualify for a PhD at the University of Michigan. It's about uh, aligning three things. Uh, government leadership, business and NGO innovation, and mass mobilization. When you get those three things together, you can get big change. Now, the key point is people assume I'm saying government leadership means government have to start. No, they don't. Sometimes the businesses and the NGOs have to move first. And we're living in a time when governments, in my view, are in retreat from big problems, especially big global problems. 
And that means I think there's a particular responsibility on NGOs and the corporate sector to be the innovators, the trailblazers, the people who show uh, what is the right way forward. Uh, we, will, we, we, sh we shouldn't abandon the idea that in the end, scale will come from governments uh, coming in. But at the moment, governments are in retreat. From If you think about the last question you asked me about innovation in public health, that's not coming from government support at the moment. Uh, they're preoccupied with their own problems. So we need to work with foundations, with the corporate sector, um, with other NGOs to make sure that we're the innovators. And so at this particular time, I think in NGOs are the innovators. They're the, 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 the people who are forging the partnerships to do things differently in a way that's going to work. We've got to be the risk takers at the moment, I would say. That doesn't necessarily apply at all periods of history. Um, 20 years ago, at uh, the time when the Millennium Development Goals were, were set, I was in government at the time, but not responsible on these issues. You had a coalition of governments driving things forward. They created the Global Alliance on Vaccines. They created the uh, Global Fund on TB and uh, AIDS and malaria. And now they're not doing that. And so it has to be from outside government that you get that innovation. The next question is about uh, what's happening here in the United States. and asks, across the nation, we've seen an increase in wildfires, floods, earthquakes, hurricanes that have displaced thousands of people. How should the United States be focused on addressing our domestic climate change refugee crisis? Did you say why or whether? How? How could the United States best prepare to address that crisis? Yeah. Well, I'm afraid we're now, I, I was Secretary of State for the Environment um, in the early 2000s, 2005, 2006, 2007. We still had an argument then about whether you have to do uh, adaptation or mit mitigation. Uh, now, it's absolutely clear you've got to do both. Uh, there has to be adaptation to the reality of climate change. We see it on the ground in the places that we work. Um, but the scientists are pretty clear that you're seeing some of it in more extreme weather events. People don't understand this, that um, global warming isn't just about an increase in average temperatures. It's also about more extreme weather events. And it's, it's dangerous to, to label one particular event as a climate event, um, but the, or a climate change event. Uh, but when you see trends, you, the scientists are now ascribing them. So I, I think that for the US, um, it obviously needs to build its defenses. Um, it has to take the precautions, but it also has to decarbonize very fast um, because uh, it, it's in its own interests um, economically. Uh, the Stern report, which I commissioned in 2006, uh, and reported in 2007, uh, or commissioned in 2005, reported in 2006, was the first ever report to look at the costs of preventing climate change versus the costs of living with climate change. And what it showed was that the costs of preventing climate change were actually much, much lower than the costs of living with it. And that remains uh, the case today. However, the US also, I think, has the opportunity and the responsibility to think and work internationally. I referred earlier to the fact that um, the uh, European Union has a net zero target of 2050. China does for 2060. Europe has a 55% renewables target by 2030. The US has the opportunity to get onto this um, this bus because um, it is a it, it is absolutely central to economic life uh, as well as the quality of the environment uh, going forward. And I don't see it as an economic sacrifice. I see it as an economic uh, self interest because you don't want um, the, the, the battery manufacturers of the future, the electric car manufacturers of the future, to necessarily follow the solar panel um, uh, manufacturers of the present, who essentially uh, have been Chinese. And there is a, a very significant industrial policy argument, as well as a, um, as well as a uh, um, environmental argument. I, I was very struck. It's already the case that the um, green technology industries have 10 times the number of employees in the U.S. as coal mining. Um, that is going to, that, that ratio is going to grow um, in the future. And that that's, it shouldn't be, a, it shouldn't be in a way that leaves coal miners stranded. I, I used to represent a former coal mining constituency, uh, but it has to be done in a way that um, maximizes both the global and the local gain. Because to state the obvious, global warming is a global phenomenon, not a country by country phenomenon. Great. Uh, we are coming close to five o'clock. And so I want to wrap up with one final question of my own. As you know, many of our audience uh, members are students 
who are support uh, IRC's work, who want to prepare themselves to be effective in dealing with challenges of this nature. What's your advice to students on how to spend their time here at Michigan? What types of skills to cultivate? What types of experiences to seek out to prepare them to be effective uh, in this complex space in which you work? So they, they should definitely work very hard and listen to what their professors tell them. Definitely. <laughs> uh, I, I'm sure you wanted me to, uh, to say that. Look, thank I look back. <laughs> I said thank you. <laughs> um, look, I think that um, guard every minute that you're a university student. Uh, I, I was so lucky to have three years at the University of Oxford and uh, 12 months at uh, MIT. And um, they were some of the most precious times of my life. And um, when I say guard, guard the moment, use the moment, um, take advantage of uh, the riches, not in the sense of just the libraries and the sports facilities. You're probably not allowed to do much sports at the moment, but <laughs> uh, the community that's there. I mean, it's it, the thing about universities that makes them extraordinary places, in my experience, is the community that they create, the community of scholarship, uh, the community of students, the community of uh, uh, research, and, and the global community that comes in the global networks that come in and um, every time I have a meeting like I do did with your uh, students today I learn something if I was a student you, you're learning every day and uh, I think it's that spirit of um, not just gratitude but inquiry and challenge uh, uh, and probing and advancing of the frontiers of one's own knowledge that makes the university experience um, particularly special and then if that can be combined if, if that term time experience can be combined with real uh, civic entrepreneurship uh, in in holiday time and uh, uh, time when you're out of the university bubble um, I think that is a really great preparation I, I, I'm extraordinarily impressed by the 20 somethings who are coming through to um, uh, seek uh, jobs not just in America I told you the story of the woman at the University of Kampala I mean there's a generation that is globally connected globally educated women as well as men in uh, proportions that have never been seen before in, in human history um, that I think is uh, incredibly empowering and um, that's I think a, a precious moment I really hope that COVID doesn't uh, spoil it but as they as, as your students think about how they prepare themselves for the future. I think it's uh, a future of global citizenship of a really profound kind because they're going to be alive in, you know, God willing, they'll be alive in, you know, effectively 2100. And that's a, a sobering uh, thought. And one, I think that they have to prepare for a, a world that's going to need them to be global citizens in a really profound way. Well, thank you, Secretary Miliband, for these uh, uh, great insights and for an engaging, important conversation. Thank you to our audience for asking such great questions. Audience members, please stay tuned on our website and our social media feeds for more information about upcoming virtual events at the Ford School and the University of Michigan as we continue our theme semester on democracy and debate. Once more, I'd like to thank Secretary David Miliband uh, for joining us today uh, for a really great conversation. Thanks very much indeed.